let's look at a really important theorem in terms of cyclic groups. Let G be a group and let A be some element of A. There's actually sort of two parts to this theorem. First of all, if A has infinite order, then, and this is hard to read, A sub I equals A sub J if and only if I equals J. If A has finite order, for sure instance N, then the group generated by A is E A A squared up to A to the N minus 1. And the same kind of thing, A sub I equals A sub J, if and only if N divides I minus J. There's a whole bunch of parts to this. So let's start with the infinite order case. So I want to show that if we've got a group with infinite order and two things are equal, the only way that can happen is if their powers were equal. Well, let's think about that. If a sub i equals a sub j. Let's go ahead and multiply both of those things on the right by a to the minus j. So I'd have a to the i times a to the negative j equals a to the j times a to the negative j. Well, what we know about these things, these things are inverses. So that has to be the identity. And this would be a to the i minus j. And by looking at our whole definitions of what exponents mean, we can do that. But wait a minute. We know that in, if a has infinite order, then the only power that would give me the identity is a to the 0. Every other power has to be something else. Therefore, if a to the i minus j has to be a to the 0, the only power that does it is if i minus j was equal to 0. The other direction, if we start with i equals j, well, that's just kind of immediate that a to the i has to equal a to the j. There's nothing to show there. Now, what about the finite order case? So we're going to say A has a finite order, which we're going to call N. So that means that we know that A to the N equals E, but no smaller element there does equal E. OK, so certainly by the definition of what that cyclic subgroup is, that must contain all powers of A. So it must contain E, because that's A to the 0, A to the first, A squared, any power, but we're going to say, you know, it needs to go up to N minus 1. Now what we really need to show is that there's nothing else except for those elements. So let's say I have A to some power, let's call it K. Basically, by doing long division, k has to be equal to some power of n, some multiple of n, plus a remainder, where that remainder is between 0 and strictly less than n. This is called the division algorithm, but really it's the way long division works. So let's think about that. If I have a to the nl plus r, that means that we have a to the nl times a to the r. If I can even break down further, a to the n to the l power 
times a to the r. But a to the n, by definition of order, that has to be e. So I've got e to the l times a to the r. But e to any power, that's just e. That's my identity. And the identity times anything is that thing. So it's a to the r. And looking back, r was something between 0 and n. r had to be one of those exponents in that set we started with. So there we go. The only, every power of a can be written as one of these things. The second part of that theorem is that the powers are equal if and only if n divides them. I'm not going to go through that proof right now, but really it's another thing just like this. If we use that division algorithm, break it down like this, it ends up being that the only way it works is if the r is 0. Because the r is 0, that means that power is a multiple of n. There are some really important consequences of this theorem, which we'll go ahead over in the next video.